uh, Bill Potter and have the pleasure of moderating our session today. Um, a seminar by Dr. James Acton on future defense spending, uh, nuclear modernization. Uh, my only real regret is that we're not able to uh, have James with us here in, uh, in Monterey. And I promise James that we will uh, arrange that in the future as soon as it's possible for us uh, to travel. I've been... So something is happening with your speaker. Yeah, I just saw, I think Caitlin or somebody muted me, but <laughs> let me try again here. So uh, what I, I'm not sure how much you missed, but uh, I, I wanted to indicate that I've, I've been fortunate to know James uh, since he burst on the nuclear arms control and disarmament scene when he was a very young nuclear physicist. And I've had the pleasure to watch him rise uh, rapidly to the top of the profession. Uh, James holds the Jessica T. Matthews chair and is co-director of the nuclear policy program uh, at the Carnegie uh, Endowment for International Peace. Uh, his current research includes a focus on the escalation risks of advanced conventional weapons and the future of arms control. Uh, he has a, a, a wealth of publications uh, which include uh, a volume on entanglement, Chinese and Russian perspectives on non-nuclear weapons and nuclear risks, a major essay in international security on escalation through entanglement, two Adelphi books uh, dealing with deterrence during disarmament and abolishing nuclear weapons uh, written with uh, George Perkovich, and another volume on why Fukushima was preventable. Uh, that's just a, a short uh, selection of, of his works. Uh, I want to note that the presentation today draws upon his recent testimony that was given before the House of Representatives Appropriations Committee, Subcommittee on Defense. Uh, James, it's a pleasure to have you with us on, on Earth Day 2021. Uh, I can't think of a more relevant topic for us to discuss today, so I'm pleased to give you the floor. Thanks, Bill, uh, and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I will preemptively accept your invitation to visit Monterey, which is something that I never try and turn down. Um, and, um, you know, thank you so much for putting this seminar together. Um, I should say in advance, we are having an uh, internet outage where I am in Arlington, Virginia at the moment. So I'm currently on my uh, iPhone hotspot. So if that fails, I will try and reconnect as soon as I possibly can. Um, as Bill mentioned, he, he, he asked me to talk a bit about the, uh, to kind of run through the testimony that I gave to House Appropriations Defense Subcommittee the other day. Um, before I did that, I thought it might be useful to reflect a little bit on appropriations as a vehicle for policy change. Uh, a lot of our community has generally focused on, uh, on trying to influence authorizers and the authorization committees in Congress. Um, and, you know, as, as, as as I think everybody's aware, the authorizing committees set policy, the appropriation committees actually spend money. Uh, my wife spent many years working for one of the appropriations committees, so I've unquestionably been influenced by her propaganda about the importance of the appropriations committees. But, you know, I just say historically it was a quite sensible, I mean, historically over the last kind of 10, 20 years, it was a very sensible idea to focus on authorizing committees, uh, House Armed Services and Senate Armed Services, and also the Foreign Relations Committees in particular. Uh, because they're much closer to our area, they're subcommittees on strategic forces on the Armed Services Committee, which are obviously like super relevant to what we do as a community. Um, and unusually, the uh, Defence Authorization has a must-pass bill in the form of the uh, National Defence uh, Authorization Act, uh, which most authorizing committees don't have that kind of must-pass bill. Um, and historically, you know, the Appropriations Committee haven't really focused on nuclear weapons. I mean, obviously the Appropriations Committee as a whole covers the whole of federal government spending. And the Defense Subcommittee, you know, nuclear is just one of many, many issues that they think about. Um, but I think the fact that um, the House Appropriations Committee was interested in having somebody to come and testify on nuclear issues is, a, is, is, is represented of the fact that that's gonna become more important to them uh, over the next 10, 20 years because expenditure on nuclear weapons is expected to rise so rapidly. Uh, and indeed, historically, um, appropriations committees have been a real battleground for nuclear spending. I mean, I think the most recent time it was like a really big battle in the appropriations committee uh, was over the conventional trident modification, 
uh, which was the Bush administration's plan to take some nuclear warheads off some Trident D5 missiles and replace those with conventional warheads. Uh, and it was ultimately the Appropriations Committee that refused funding for that program. Since then, the battles have generally taken place in, in, in the relevant author authorizing committees. Uh, but, you know, as I say, with expenditure ex expected to ramp up, um, uh, I think appropriations is going to be an increasingly big battleground for what we do. Uh, and I think as a community that uh, uh, it's worth kind of trying to build links into. Um, what, uh, one of the, the reason why it's becoming this great battleground is because uh, the United States today stands at the beginning of a third wave of nuclear modernization. The sensible way to do nuclear modernization would have been to modernize a few systems at a time so that expenditure remains roughly constant. Um, that fits in much easier, more straightforwardly with the way that the executive and the congressional branches work. In practice, we haven't take, done that. We had a big wave of modernization uh, in the late 1950s and the early 1960s, where you know, a whole slew of new systems came online. There was a similar wave at the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s. Um, and now there is a third wave coming. Uh, virtually every warhead, missile, delivery system, command and control asset, uh, and, and uh, you know, the infrastructure that supports the production of warheads is gonna need modernization. Uh, most of the exceptions are systems that have just been modernized. You know, they're part of the pre-wave. And as a result of that, expenditure on nuclear weapons, nuclear forces is going, to arise, uh, is, is going to rise dramatically in the United States. And I think some of that is just inevitable. Um, so I'm going to try to avoid just like bombarding everybody with figures throughout the whole of this. But, um, uh, you know, just to set the scene here, the Congressional Budget Office issued its last 10 year report in 2019. Uh, and it predicted that expenditure on nuclear forces was going to rise from uh, about 36 billion in 2019 to 63 billion in 2028. So almost doubling over a period of almost 10 years. Um, that will go from about 5% to 7% of the defense budget. Now, you know, I'd emphasize that a lot of that is operations and maintenance. Not all of that is modernization by any means. Uh, and I, you know, Obviously, you need to do operation and maintenance spending just by keeping nuclear forces, you know, regardless of any modernization. Uh, but it also predicted that total expenditure over that 10 year period would be about $500 billion. What's interesting, though, and it's significant, is that expenditure will continue to rise after that period is over. Um, so the peak in expenditure is expected to be roughly in the mid 2030s. Um, and then in its most recent report over 30 years, uh, which is now four years old, CBO predicted that 30-year uh, spending on nuclear forces would be about $1.2 trillion. Um, given that the cost of individual programs has risen in the last four years, that's almost certainly an underestimate uh, of, of, of now of total expenditure. But, you know, we're looking for something over 30 years, which is, you know, a very long time period now, well in excess of a trillion dollars. Now, not all of that expenditure comes from DOD. Uh, everything related to warheads comes from Department of Energy, which in the vagaries of the way Congress works, um, uh, DOD is appropriated through the Defense Subcommittee, uh, whereas DOE is appropriate, Department of Energy and NNSA, National Nuclear Security Administration, uh, is appropriated through the Energy and Water Subcommittee. Uh, and like famously, nobody goes on energy and water because they care about nuclear weapons. They go on energy and water because they want enormously expensive water product uh, uh, projects in dry districts out west. Um, I'm not going to talk very much about, I'm going to say hardly anything about the DOE side of things. Um, I'd simply make two or three points. The biggest and most controversial program coming up in DOE is the W93 warhead, uh, which is appears to be uh, I mean, it is a submarine launched warhead um, that appears to be higher in yield than the W-76, the existing mainstay of the force, though probably lower in yield than the W-88, which is the high yield warhead. Um, I think there is a real danger in D Department of Energy trying to do too much and doing it badly. Um, the DOE infrastructure 
like genuinely is decaying and is in need of an upgrade. Uh, and I think there is a real risk of it trying to spread itself too thinly. So I'm pretty skeptical of the W93, which, you know, to a large extent seems to be driven as much by developments in the UK as it does over here. And, you know, this is also going to become, there's a lot of cooperation on this warhead with the UK. So I'm pretty skeptical about the W93, but I'm not going to go into that in much more detail. What I do want to focus on is three different areas of expenditure on the DOD side. Uh, and ask kind of three questions. What's actually necessary for the security of the United States and its allies? Is everything we're doing necessary? Secondly, can expenditure be delayed for at least some period of time? You know, because of this huge bow wave in expenditure, there is actually an advantage here in being able to delay expenditure even if you can't completely get rid of it. And thirdly, however much we spend on nuclear weapons, are we spending that money in the on the most important program, is our prioritization actually right? And to that end, there's three programs I want to focus on. The first one is the new ICBM, the ground-based strategic deterrent, which I think um, could be de certainly delayed and possibly canceled. The second one is the new sea launch cruise missile, which I'm in favor of scrapping. And the third one is nuclear command and control, which I think we're not spending enough money on. So in terms of the ground-based strategic deterrent, the United States today currently operates 400 Minuteman three ICBMs uh, in silos. The ground-based strategic deterrent is the replacement program for these uh, Minuteman three ICBMs. Uh, this is a program, the goal is to get missiles in the ground by 2036. The program is gonna last the aim is to keep those missiles there for at least 40 years out to 2075. Uh, and the cost of this program is truly enormous. I mean, the Air Force and CAPE, which is the bit of the Pentagon, that es the independent part of the Pentagon that estimates costs of programs independently from the services, surprisingly always thinks they're going to cost more than the services do. Um, their joint estimate is now about $95 billion for the cost of this program, um, which is... Um, the, um, um, the appears to be probably the second largest after the new SSBN. Let's start with why the Pentagon argues it needs new ICBMs. And the Pentagon says that it, it, they create an intractable targeting problem for Russia, that it's impossible for Russia to destroy US ICBMs preemptively. And I think when you break this down, there's really three sub reasons for that. The first one is the Pentagon, I think, is assuming that Russia would fire two nuclear warheads at each silo. So, you know, Russia has to use up two of its warheads for every ICBM it destroys. So it's an unfavorable exchange ratio. Second point to the Pentagon's argument is this idea of launch under attack, that the US has the capability to launch ICBMs before incoming nuclear weapons hit the ground. So it can so-called launch from under, um, you know, to launch ICBMs before they're to be destroyed. And the third argument is that the enormous damage and destruction that would be done to the United States in launching a pre Russian preemptive attack on ICBMs is actually a feature rather than a bug. You know, it would make US nuclear retaliation totally credible because Russia would have done so much damage to the US. And if we got rid of ICBM, so the argument goes, there would be very, very few aim points in the US anymore. And Russia might think it could just, you know, launch nukes against these few aim points, you know, bomber bases, submarine bases, leadership, and it wouldn't kill so enough people uh, to make US nuclear retaliation credible. Now look, I have lots of problems with, this with these arguments. Um, and I'm not gonna go through all of them today. I mean, you know, I think launch under attack is a bad idea and I think we should try to get away from it. You know, I point out that kind of Russian leadership targets are, you know, within a blast radius from where I'm currently sitting in a highly populated area of Northern Virginia and Washington DC. But let's just take these arguments at face value, right? Let's just, let's just not try and argue with Pentagon requirements. Let's actually just assume that the US really does need ICBMs. What I point out about all of these arguments the Pentagon is making is there a really bad argument for new ICBMs. 
old ICBMs actually probably make just as an effective a sponge as new ICBMs do. And moreover, you know, there's a lot of concern about submarine survivability. Um, and, you know, whether US submarines are gonna be survivable over the long term. I think the, um, I think the, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I think the, <laughs> the real issue here is whether uh, silos are more or less survivable than ICBMs. Um, because one, um, you know, the silos are going to be vulnerable, I worry, to very long range, highly precise, conventional weapons. And that's actually likely to happen, I think, before submarines become vulnerable to very sophisticated forms um, of anti-submarine warfare. So all of these, I think, are pretty bad arguments for developing a whole new system of ICBMs in the form of the ground-based strategic deterrent. I'm also, I have to say, not a huge fan of just digging up the ICBMs and removing them from the ground right away. I mean, firstly, you know, in the real world, you have to worry about the politics of this and the politics of this is just horrible. Um, you know, there are Western states for whom these are huge generators of jobs and there would be massive opposition. Um, I also think these are potentially useful trade bait in arms control negotiations with the Russians. Um, you know, if you want an agreement that got rid of fixed ICBMs, you have to have something that you can trade for that. Um, and then, um, you know, I also, as much as I think the ICBMs will probably become vulnerable before submarines are, um, I still don't think it's the worst idea to keep ICBMs as a hedge in case that calculation turns out to be wrong. But as I say, you know, all of these considerations suggest to me that we're much better off uh, by trying to life extend minimum three rather than build new ICBMs. Now the Pentagon's response to this is you just can't, or it's completely uneconomic to try to life extend minimum three. Uh, and specifically, they point to an analysis of alternatives that was completed in 2015 uh, that concluded that building a whole set of new ICBMs is the most cost-effective way to go. And I think, you know, I don't know the details of that study, I can't critique it on a classified level. But as always with government studies, the question is what assumptions go into that study. And specifically, you know, the assumptions were, to the extent it's been reported in public, and you know, huge shout out, I don't think he's on the call, but Kingston Reef uh, from ACA, who's really kind of, you know, follows these issues and, and, and is a primary source of information on all of this. Um, but the reporting here is that what that 2015 analysis of alternatives concluded, uh, no, it was the assumptions that went into it, was that the US needed to retain 450 ICBMs out to 2075. And it really only looked at three options. There was basically two different op ways of replacing Minuteman three in the short term. And the third option was life extending Minuteman three out to 2075. Now, I think there's various reasons why this study deserves a new look, why we shouldn't just take the 2015 analysis of alternatives on face value. The first thing is that the cost of ground-based strategic deterrent has grown by almost 50% since then. You know, if what they say is the cheapest option has got 50% more expensive in like six or seven years, I think that should give us serious pause uh, that they got the right answer back in 2015. But also, you know, they assume that we had to keep 450 ICBMs. That requirement has already been reduced to 400 ICBMs. And if you reduce that requirement further and you don't even necessarily have to reduce it dramatically, you know, maybe you can keep ICB, the existing minimum three ICBMs operative for longer. Because for example, you have more ICBMs to test. You know, one of the arguments that the Pentagon makes about why it needs new ICBMs is that it's running out of minimum three ICBMs to test. But that's based on this requirement for 400 ICBMs. If the requirement was only 350 ICBMs, all of a sudden you'd have an extra 50 ICBMs to test. And moreover, we shouldn't just consider no life extension of minimum three or a life extension to 2075. There's intermediate options. There's life extensions out to 2045 or 2055 or 2065. 
And you know, maybe that, maybe those are more cost-effective options. So I don't think, you know, I, as an NGO person who doesn't have clearances and has never seen the classified on this, you know, I can't definitively say that the 2015 analysis of alternatives is wrong. But I think there is a compelling, compelling case um, for why that study should be revisited. And I also don't think that DOD itself can revisit this study credibly at this point. I think the only, I think the best option at this point is for an independent commission, uh, you know, experts with the relevant clearances, uh, to really look at this question of can Minuteman 3 be life extended. And so the recommendation that I made to Congress was to reduce funding to GBSD down to the lowest level consistent with just keeping the program in its current state, uh, pending an independent inquiry into whether Minuteman 3 could be life extended. Next program that I want to discuss briefly is the nuclear arms slicker. And the primary argument that's made for this program, so sorry, SLICM is a nuclear arms sea launch cruise missile. The US has had this capability before, but decided to scrap it during the Obama nuclear posture review. Um, the primary argument that's made for rebuilding a new nuclear arms SLICM is a lower yield warhead. And often this argument is phrased by proponents in terms of, you know, don't you think we, the US needs a lower yield nuclear warhead? And incidentally, I say lower yield rather than low yield because in nuclear standards, low yield is still enormous. I mean, you know, low yield might be one kiloton or five kilotons, but these are still truly colossal blasts by conventional standards. So I think lower yield helps remind us of that. This argument that doesn't the US need a lower yield warhead is misleading because the US already has three lower yield warheads in the stockpile at the moment. Um, the B-6112 gravity bomb, or sorry, the B-61 gravity bomb, which is currently being life extended into the B-6112. Uh, there is the low yield D-5 warhead on some Trident ice, uh, sea launch ballistic missiles. I am no fan of this idea, but the costs associated with, that, with, with this concept are very, very small. So I'm not going to focus on that particularly today. Uh, and then there's a low yield war, uh, warhead with a low yield option on the air launch cruise missile, which will be modernized as part of the LRSO program, the long range standoff weapon program. And so really what the nuclear arm SLICM is about is a fourth lower yield option. Um, and this program is about nine, you know, very, very rough cost estimate by CBO is about $9 billion, assuming that it uh, uses a lot of the technology developed for the new L cruise missile, the LRSO. My main critique of this program from, you know, and, and then here I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make these arguments in terms that might appeal to DOD. I'm not necessarily making these arguments in terms of disarmament or risk reduction, but in terms of like, trying to kind of meet, argue in terms of the criteria that DOD sets for itself. It seems to me that the big problem with the nuclear arm SLICM is it's entirely redundant with LRSO, the new cruise missile. You know, the argument that's made is that the new nuclear arm SLICM might be more survivable pre-launch because um, attack submarines that would presumably carry this are very survivable. But the United States is currently spending $120 billion on building a new stealthy bomber, the B-21, armed with LRSO. And the idea is this combination of a stealthy aircraft carrying a long range missile means it can you know, approach other countries, but doesn't have to get all that close. It can stay out of the worst part of their air defenses uh, and then launch this LRSO, this air launch cruise missile, uh, from a location in which the aircraft is, 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 is entirely survivable. So, you know, if DOD is making the argument that it needs the nuclear armed sea launch cruise missile because the new bomber is not survivable, for me, that's an argument against building the new bomber. Um, you know, if we're really spending $120 billion on a new bomber that's not survivable um, when carrying a long range cruise missile, you know, let's just not build the new bomber. Now, I, I'm in favor of the new bomber, largely on conventional grounds, apart from anything else. So I, I think it probably will be survivable. But, you know, if the argument is really one about pre-launch survivability, then let's just scrap the new bomber and LRSO. And post-launch, you know, in terms of like air defense is shooting down cruise missiles. Post-launch, these two are going to have identical flight profiles. 
I mean, if LR, especially if LRSO is based on, sorry, especially if the new sea launch cruise missile is based on LRSO, you'd expect these things to have very, very similar, if not entirely identical flight profiles. So you wouldn't expect one to be more survivable than the other. So, you know, I think there's a very strong case for scrapping the nuclear armed uh, sea launch cruise missile. The final issue that I want to touch on is nuclear command and control. And this is an area on which I think we are underspending at the moment. I think, you know, I wouldn't actually redirect all of the money that I would save on my initiatives to conventional forces or to so domestic programs. Like I think some of that money ought to be spent on nuclear command and control, which I really think ought to be the top priority. Um, not just because you need nuclear command and control to do everything else associated with nuclear weapons, but also as it, it's critical for risk reduction. You know, poor nuclear command and control is a recipe for inadvertent escalation in a crisis. The problem that worries me more than anything else with nuclear command and control is that we don't, we the United States, don't have a nuclear command and control system. We have a command and control system that does both nuclear and non-nuclear operations. It is a dual use command and control system. I dare say there are some class, many classified assets that are nuclear only, but most of the kind of big publicly acknowledged assets for things like early warning and long range communication are all explicitly acknowledged to be dual use. And this I think creates a real risk in a crisis, which is that an adversary in a conventional war, and when I say adversary here, I really mean Russia or China, that Russia and China might attack command and control, dual use command and control assets, potentially just for the purpose of trying to win or not lose a conventional war, you know, undermine US conventional missile defenses, undermine US conventional communications in an effort in, as a part of conventional war fighting. But these attacks against command and control assets would have the incidental effect of degrading the US nuclear command and control architecture. And when I started looking into this problem, and you know, this has kind of occupied me, the biggest thing that I've been working on for a number of years now, I like assumed that US nuclear command and control was really survivable. And the more I got into this problem, the more shocked I was to learn that it wasn't really survivable. You know, just to give you one example, the existing US early warning architecture, uh, early warning satellites. You know, there's a few legacy defense support program satellites, and then the new the new system is called this is called SIBIS, the space based infrared system. The commander of space, com former command, the then commander of space command, I should say, has publicly acknowledged this system has a single point vulnerability. In other words, there is you know if you took down a particular satellite, and it's you know clear at the unclassified level which one he means, this system would lose the ability to to continuously monitor potential adversary missile launches. And I think this demands a, 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 a fundamental change in the way we think about nuclear command and control. Historically, nuclear command and control has been driven by the manif the design of nuclear command and control has been driven by the manifestly important objective of survival during a nuclear war, right? Which is obviously important, you know, you want your command and control system to be able to survive nuclear blast to the extent it can, electromagnetic pulse particularly. But it seems to me we should have two co-equal objectives. One is survival during a nuclear war, but the other one is survival against conventional attacks before a nuclear war starts. And my impression is this problem, people pay lip service to it on the inside, but if you look at what we're actually spending money, we're just not doing that. So for example, the next generation so-called OPIA, Overhead Persistent Infrared System, which will be the satellite constellation that will replace Cibus, that's gonna have one fewer satellite in than Cibus. It's gonna go, we're gonna go from six satellites to five satellites. We're actually making capabilities that are less redundant than they were. Now, I don't necessarily think the answer here is just a bit more redundancy, like building seven or eight exquisitely capable but highly vulnerable satellites. I think we at least ought to consider radically different forms of nuclear command and control. So for example, one thing you could do is uh, develop much smaller early warning sensors that would be less capable, but you could uh, have them piggybacking on lots of other satellites 
used for other purposes. So rather than having just six early warning satellites, you could have 20 or 30. Um, you would be, you know, if you did this instead of dedicated early warning satellites, you would be trading off capability, increasing redundancy at the expense of reduced capability. I think that's probably a trade-off we should be willing to take, but I certainly think it's a trade-off that DOD should look at seriously. So kind of those were my three big areas of recommendation. It was delay GBSD pending an inquiry into the feasibility of extending minimum three. It was um, um, to scrap the new nuclear arms sea launch cruise missile uh, and to you know, rethink nuclear command and control, which will probably be involving spending more money on it. What do I think will happen? I think, you know, my, my guess is that my recommendation you know, on the nuclear arms silicon is probably gonna happen. Like, I, I, not because I'm suggesting it, but I just think that it seems to be quite unlikely that the new administration is actually gonna request funding for this system. Unfortunately, the other two areas, I suspect that they're gonna go the other way. I think the politics of not replacing GBSD are going to be too difficult to deal with, and they're just going to, sorry, the politics is not replacing minimum three are going to be too difficult to deal with. Um, and that they're going to, um, sim, you know, they're going to pursue GBSD. And the problem with nuclear command and control is I just think there is no constituency for this. You know, very, very few members of Congress remotely care about this. It's actually quite an eclectic bunch that does. Like, believe it or not, two of the most active members in this are Elizabeth Warren and Ted Cruz. And I kind of struggle to think of two members who, you know, who probably disagree on most things as much as those do, but they're actually kind of quite interested in this, but they are very much the exception rather than the rule. Um, so, you know, I, unfortunately I am worried that nuclear command and control is gonna to continue to be shortchanged. So that's, that's my prediction for what I think will happen. Uh, in any case, let me kind of thank you all for your time and attention and just say how much I'm looking forward to having a conversation on this. Thank you so much, uh, James. Um, this was really very, very uh, you know, a rich uh, menu that you uh, provided us. And I know I have at least a half dozen questions that I would like to ask, but I'm, I'm not going to start uh, with them. I'm going to instead uh, ask those of you who are on the, uh, uh, the call uh, to uh, ideally uh, indicate uh, through uh, either uh, the chat function or I think at least on my system, if under reactions, you can raise your hand, that would be, uh, would be great. But if all else fails, you could try to uh, kind of wave, although uh, because I have so many uh, people here, I, I may not uh, see you, but I see that Avner, okay, I, I'm gonna call upon Avner and Sarah. I have the two of you uh, on the list uh, first. So uh, go ahead, Avner, why don't you ask a question and uh, uh, then I'll turn to Sarah. Thank you. Good to see you, James. I haven't seen you for a while <laughs> during this COVID. This is complex, arcane, and area that uh, the public, even the knowledgeable elite of the public, tends hardly to discuss. Uh, much of it, and it's debatable even how much of that is classified and it's unknown. Uh, in particular, the areas of, of command and control, the architecture of command and control. So, so, so part of the issue is to begin, what would be your recommendation on the procedural level, how to run in a democracy like this one at a point that we are now, 2021, uh, you know, 30 years after the end of the Cold War, intelligible discussion that will be as much as possible uh, with information and uh, well-informed and at the same time it could be effective and there will be some impact to people outside the very, um, the priesthood of those people who are the very few who, who knows. So how to make that kind of thing more open? It, it's a great question, Afner. And, you know, I was about, to, when you said you haven't seen me in a while, I was about to say, I haven't seen anybody in a while, at least a person. <laughs> so I, I'd say, at a time when American politics feels particularly broken, I would say one thing we, that we do well is transparency in nuclear issues compared to every other nuclear arms state. It's certainly true that there is a lot of classification around nuclear weapons and nuclear command and control. 
But there's actually a tremendous amount about nuclear command and control that is publicly available. Um, you know, just to give you one example, in the US, when major defense programs run over the budget by a certain amount, they fall foul of something called the non McClurdy rules, which, you know, nominally they have to be canceled, but in practice, they're allowed to continue if the executive branch submits special reports to Congress about the importance of the program. There is huge amounts of information in class about, about, about command and control in these reports. People don't, you know, they're not very well known, they're kind of obscure, but they're exceptionally useful. Similarly, budget documents have huge amounts of information. So, you know, I actually think there is, there is enough about nuclear command and control to have a good sensible conversation that's already been declassified. One problem is that people on the inside are often unaware of what's classified and what's not and what's unclassified. So they're often unwilling to go into the details because they're worried what they're saying is classified even when it's publicly available. Um, I think it's very going to be very hard to get the public interested in nuclear command and control and something I've never really tried to do. I think if there were kind of, and you know, a lot of this falls afoul of just how broken our politics are and how polarized everything becomes. If there was one air kind of imaginable structural reform in which I think would be doable, at least more doable, would be to have more independent oversight on these issues. I mean, you know, I've advocated my idea, it's not just my idea, but for an independent commission on GBSD. I think the same thing is, is useful for nuclear command and control. I mean, you could do this by a National Academies type body or a Jason type body. But I do think that there is, it's very hard for independent experts like me to make compelling cases for changes of policy without classified information, right? I think we can point out problems, we can ask the right questions, but it's very, very hard to make a compelling case. Um, and, you know, as with any, it's not a DOD problem, it's a bureaucratic problem. You know, bu bureaucracies kind of meet, reach a decision and then stick to that decision unless they're absolutely forced to change. So I do think like more independent review and oversight by people with the relevant clearances is a, is a, is a, is kind of one of, would be the best change that I would like to make in this area. Um, and, you know, there should be a requirement that, that their products are declassified, you know, maybe you have a classified annex as well, but, you know, they, they should, they should summarize, you know, that the, the, the primary products of those kind of commissions ought to be unclassified. Um, and, you know, that, that I think would improve the debate and the discussion significantly. I wouldn't particularly engage large numbers of people. Like I just don't know how to do that. Yeah, just a tiny follow up. The problem is group thinking. Group thinking is always, I mean, when, when you ask retired people from that kind of industry, that kind of endeavor to, to look into that, the problem is that they are looking the way they have thought about it in the past and that's... Yeah. So I think that's exactly right. I think you have, for these commissions to be meaningful, you have to have cognitive diversity. I mean, there's, there are values to all forms of diversity, particularly in this kind of commission. Cognitive diversity, I think, is very important. Like, you know, everybody has to have the relevant clearances, but like you should have people who are, you know, ex-industry people. You should have, try to have kind of NGO think tankers type, you know, you should, the only way that I can think of to avoid groupthink is by having this kind of diversity within the group. And I think that is possible. I mean, you know, there are plenty of people who of, 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 of cognitively diverse people who actually do have or could obtain the relevant clearances without very much difficulty. Thank you, James. James, before I call on Sarah, can you just provide us with some uh, kind of dollar estimate uh, that uh, you think would make a difference were we to uh, try to uh, uh, pursue uh, and improve uh, command and control uh, kind of system? I realize there, there are all kinds of variants here, but I don't, I don't think you, uh, from your testimony, you, you kind of give us a, a flavor for uh, you know how much money we're really talking about. Because I I would think that some of the things that you you kind of suggested would actually not be you know uh, usually expensive. But I, that's that's just that may be an impression that's mis misguided or misplaced. Yeah, thanks. But I mean, I didn't. It's a great question. I didn't do that because I don't have good estimates. I mean, my sense is that you're looking at. And sorry, I should say a lot of this depends on whether 
you do things like dispersed architectures instead of or in addition to dedicated systems. Um, you know, obviously creating a dispersed architecture alongside exquisite new dedicated early warning satellites is a lot more expensive than just doing one or the other. Um, but, you know, my sense is that, you know, spending, you know, picking a number like out of nowhere, like, you know, increasing nuclear command and control spending by $10 billion would make a huge difference. And on the scale that we're talking about, it's a relative, you know, it's the same amount as the Slickham. It is a tenth or a tenth as much as GBSD. So, you know, you can make a, this is an area in which you can make a big difference with relatively modest amounts of spending. Um, on the other hand, you know, that money has to come from somewhere and all of the other programs have much stronger, more entrenched support than nuclear command and control has. Um, and that, that, you know, both within the executive branch and within Congress. And I think those, those kind of dynamics, you know, it's very easy to say $10 billion is not that much money by DOD standards, and that's true, but it's also kind of hard to carve that out unless there's a real constituency for it, which there's not. Thanks, James. Sarah, do you want to ask, and maybe if I could just ask people to identify themselves uh, before you ask uh, your question. Sure. Hi, James. Um, nice to see you. Sarah Bidgood, um, direct the Eurasia Nonproliferation Program here. I had a question actually about the, um, the Biden administration's interim national security strategic guidance, which I know came out in March. And I also know that you gave your testimony in March, so I don't know sort of what the timing of those two things looked like. But I noticed that in one section, they, they do talk about the need to kind of move away from, you know, unneeded legacy platforms so that resources can be freed up for sort of more cutting edge technologies and capabilities. And I wondered sort of how that factored into your analysis of which of these three systems that you're kind of looking at might be funded or not funded and whether, and exactly what you thought that meant. I'm just curious about your perspective. Thanks. Sarah, do I remember rightly that that, wasn't, that was not about nuclear weapons specifically? It was a much more general statement about the force as a whole. I think that's right. And it was also sort of in this bigger context of like strategic stability and sort of engagement with China and Russia and, and things like that. So I would have to go back and see, it's a great question. I'd have to go back and see the exact language. Like I just, I, 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 but my, my recollection is that was about the force as a whole. Uh, and not about nuclear weapons specifically. And, you know, that guidance was extremely general. I mean, as it inevitably would be. I mean, it said some kind of nice generalities that were kind of good to hear, but it's not. Um, and if it wasn't said about nuclear weapons specifically, I would assume that the authors weren't thinking about nuclear weapons at all when they wrote it. Um, but in some sense, like that is the fundamental debate about GBSD and Minuteman 3. You know, does it cost you more to keep Minuteman 3 in the ground than it would to replace it by GBSD? You know, my sense is if you did an honest study on that with, I mean, honest is the wrong word because I don't think people deliberately like, let me, let me choose a better word. Like if you did a study that considered a wider range of options, you know, a study that wasn't, didn't only look at options that were the most favorable for GBSD, then you, my sense is that minimum th life extending minimum three could be quite a competitive thing to do. Um, you know, the other legacy platforms here, I mean, you know, are higher class SSBNs. There's no real debate about whether to replace them with Columbia class, like everybody thinks you should. Like B21 is going to happen, like even if you don't like B21 on nuclear grounds, like I mean, that's a fairly compelling case for doing it on conventional grounds. So as I say, like my sense is that that statement was much more about conventional forces than it was about nuclear forces, but I'd need to go back and double check the exact context that it appeared in. Thanks so much. You know, you know, implicit in your, in your presentation uh, is a kind of a, a model if you will, of uh, the drivers for force modernization and the degree uh, to which uh, you know they can be impacted. I mean, the extent to which you're really talking about, you know, is this an action-reaction process? Is it one driven by uh, you know technical innovation? Uh, is it one uh, primarily of, of uh, organizational and bureaucratic politics? Um, I think it's really important. I mean, if, if you could, I mean, your impression. Of the main drivers, because otherwise we're in a situation where you may, as a uh, you know, an outside analyst, uh, make you know very, very profound uh, and compelling arguments, but in fact they may have no traction whatsoever. And so, I mean, I, I'm curious if, if you 
uh, can share with us kind of your perspective of how uh, decisions are made with respect to these issues uh, so that we are better able to figure out, if, if it's possible to figure out, how we can move from uh, your analysis to actually impacting on policy. Uh, and I, I know we have a number of other people uh, on the call here. I, if, I believe he may still be with us, uh, uh, former Congressman Howard Berman, who uh, was the ranking uh, Democrat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, may also want to come in here if, if uh, he with, wants to share his insights. But I first turn to you, James, if, if you can give us some sense of uh, what you see as the, uh, the factors driving policy in this area. So I think it's a very deep question and, and, and I haven't thought about it exactly this way before. So this is kind of like a bit off the top of my head. The, you know, I don't think you can ignore the fact that the nuclear, nuclear forces are genuinely aging. Um, you know, a lot of these stuff is very, it's genuinely old. The costs of maintaining it are going to go up and up. Like, you know, I do think there is a genuine case for a fair amount of modernization here. One driver is, you know, large bureaucracies and DOD is like a prototypical large demo, uh, democracy, uh, bureaucracy, like doing things the same, right? The easiest thing to do if you have existing silo-based ICBMs is buy something that looks very much like the existing system, right? If you have a few de dedicated early warning satellites, let's just buy better versions of what we have at the moment. You know, fundamentally rethinking changes in nuclear posture is difficult. You have to do stuff differently. So I do think that is a major driver. Um, I think there is a, certainly a degree of action reaction here. Um, though I don't want to overstate that in this case. Uh, I mean, you often hear, you know, Russia and China are modernizing, therefore we have to. Right? I've never found this a compelling argument. Like we should modernize if we need to, to keep our, new, our forces safe and effective. We shouldn't if we don't. My guess is this is an excuse rather than a reason, right? DOD would be making arguments for exactly the same programs, even if Russia and China were, mo were not modernizing. But I think it genuinely it does get traction in Congress. I think this is a, 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 a good argument that people, you know, that, that members can use to uh, support spending money. Um, and then I think, you know, you do have constituents, very strong constituencies for particular aspects of the force. So for, you know, the classic, the clearest example of that is, you know, silo-based ICBMs. I mean, they're spread over, uh, you know, the bases are associated with three states, but the silos are actually in five states. And these, I think, I, I think, I, I don't know if this is true, but I've certainly heard that those bases are the single largest employers in those states, or at least in some of them. I mean, you know, you've got uh, Minot, Maelstrom and Warren, uh, and those are, you know, and, and, and um, ensuring, you know, you'll be huge amount of opposition which in the House may not matter much because, you know, many, most of these states just have one member, but in the Senate, you know, they all have two out of a hundred. So, you know, they, those senators have a huge amount of power and influence. Um, so as I say, I think there's a mixture of factors here. I mean, I don't want to play, downplay the first factor, like the force genuinely is aging. And there are, you know, if you think that, you know, my view is nuclear weapons do help deter in a small range of extremely high consequence contingencies. And I think, you know, there are strategic reasons for wanting to keep a force that can maintain that deterrent. But, you know, the, the, those kind of rational strategic motivations are only one part of this broader picture. Thanks, James. Howard, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if, if you do want to weigh in uh, about, you know, how we might be able to influence the congressional uh, kind of budgetary uh, uh, process here, uh, I'd be delighted to give you for an hour or, or later. Uh, Bill, I don't see him on the participant list anymore. I think you okay. left the call. I must have anticipated my question. Okay. Okay. I have, uh, I see Philip on, on, has his hand up. Would you like to? Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Hey, James. And thanks for the, the great talk. Nice to see you, at least virtually. Um, so I wanted to reflect a little bit on an issue that you raised, which is I feel like there's a growing appreciation of the relationship between conventional strike capabilities and uh, nuclear strategy. Um, and you raised this a little bit in your talk. Um, and it feels to me, and obviously both in the sense that conventional strike capabilities can substitute for nuclear weapons, and also in the sense that they can threaten them. It feels to me like despite that appreciation, I'm not sure how much we're actually planning the future of our nuclear force capabilities around that. It sort of feels like 
from my read, and I'm curious to hear your read, that we sort of acknowledge that, and then we're back in this world of planning sort of nuclear force on force structure, you know, force on force dynamics. And so I just wonder, to what extent do you think that very fundamental driver of the future of our, of the role of nuclear weapons is actually being taken into consideration in thinking about future nuclear force structures for the United States? It's a good, uh, thanks, Ron. Good to see you as always, uh, Philip. It's a great question. I, I, a couple of thoughts. I mean, firstly, it's not just this is an example of a more general trend of non-nuclear weapons that can undermine nuclear forces and their enabling capabilities. I mean, this is true not just of high-precision conventional weapons, cyber capabilities, um, anti-satellite capabilities. I mean, in a general sense, I would say that I think concerns about the vulnerability of nuclear forces are very real but overstated, whereas concerns about vulnerability of nuclear command and control are very real and understated. Um, the short answer is I don't think we think about this nearly enough. Um, I once had a very interesting discussion with somebody from one of the contractors involved in GBSD. And when I made this point about silos becoming vulnerable to conventional weapons, her argument was, yeah, but we have a launch under attack. So like if an adversary launches conventional ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, whatever it was at silos, then we can just launch those silos from under attack. I didn't really have a chance to follow up, but like, I think this is, you know, the idea of launching 400 high yield ICBMs because somebody's attacked us with conventional weapons. Like Russia and China think that's not credible, right? They worry about US conventional capabilities precisely because they worry that it's not credible for them to respond with nukes to a conventional attack. So, you know, I, I, I find this argument deeply unpersuasive that, you know, launch under attack saves us from ICBM vulnerability in the face of conventional weapons. And I think you know nobody like nobody wants to have this discussion, which is odd because everybody's obsessed with SSBN's vulnerability. Um, so I think we don't think enough about the vulnerability of, and this is a long-term thing. This is not a short-term thing, but the long-term vulnerability of U.S. nuclear forces to conventional attack. We don't think nearly enough about the way that. US conventional weapons that we're not developing for the purpose of undermining the Russians and Chinese arsenal, nuclear arsenals, give them concern about the survivability of their forces. That's another problem we don't think enough about. I actually think there is a lot of awareness within DOD about the potential vulnerability of command and control. It does not, however, seem to be translating into doing anything differently. And I, I don't, I don't have a great the, the command and control process by which command and control is decided is so opaque. Like, I just don't understand how like requirements are translated into systems. And it's particularly difficult because so much of command and control is dual use. I mean, to give you one example, you know, now the commander of STRATCOM is nominally in charge of nuclear command and control in the US. And I once asked somebody from DOD, you know, I said, look, Commander Stratcom is in charge of this, but these are all dual use assets. So other people have a say on them as well. You know, if there's a disagreement between nuclear requirements and non-nuclear requirements, how is that adjudicated? Who makes a decision? And I got a 10 minute answer that had approximately zero information. Like I, I literally was no wiser at the end of that answer than at the beginning. So I, 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 I there is at least awareness of that problem, but I, for whatever reason, it just is not translating into anything, like doing anything differently. I mean, at least at the unclassified level. I mean, you know, one can always hope that there's a whole bunch of classified command or control that come out in a crisis and save us. Um, I think there is some of that, but I'm questioning how much there is when it comes to early warning and long range communications. Thank you, James. I mean, uh... I, I see there, there are also uh, questions or comments in the chat, and I'll turn to that in a moment. Uh, but I'd also encourage those of you who, who want to raise your hand uh, in the participants uh, kind of icon to, to do so. And I, I see Josh Pollack uh, does have his hand up. So Josh, I'll give you the floor and then I'll turn to the chat if I don't see other hands in the uh, participants list. Thank you, Bill. Uh, hi, James. Uh, very good talk. Uh, there is one uh, Point I'd like to get some clarification on. Uh, in your discussion of command and control, uh, every example, uh, nearly every example you gave was actually early warning, which I, I would say is, 
is intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, not command and control. Uh, are there command and control examples you can give of, of a dual use uh, phenomena? Uh, I, I have the impression that there was more in the way of dedicated nuclear command and control. Now, early warning may be the opposite. It, it may have grown together over time with, with early warning assets being used for, for to cue missile defenses and so forth. But I wonder if, if this is equally as true of, of command and control. Thanks, Josh. Um, in my writing, I always try to say C3I rather than just command, command, control, communications, and intelligence. I was kind of being sloppy with language today. I think there are two C3I functions that are particularly difficult and vulnerable to attack. One is early warning that I won't discuss anymore. The other is long range communication, by which I mean, you know, sending potentially execution messages from political leaders wherever they are to nuclear forces that are potentially very, very long distances away in the field. Um, again, somebody you know, who's involved on this on the dark side described this as the last tactical mile. I think it's more appropriate to call it the last tactical 5,000 miles. That is a, you know, there are only a limited number of ways of sending messages over extremely long distances. Now those are not, you know, to be clear, there's lots of other command and control functions, but I think, you know, those C3I functions, those two, uh, early warning and uh, long range communications, I think are uniquely difficult. In terms of long range communications, there are three, I'm sorry, four publicly acknowledged systems out there. The first one is the satellite, which is the legacy Milstar and the modern and the current advanced extremely high frequency constellation. Um, these satellites are, I mean, everything that I'm gonna tell you is explicitly acknowledged to be dual use here is the punchline, but like, you know, AEHF, Advanced Extremely High Frequency, is the most protected constellation the US has. It's used from everything from special operators up to nuclear forces, um, you know, including stuff like SSN. So it's totally a target in a, in a conventional war. There's then two systems of transmitters. There's the Global High Frequency Communication Network, which are for bombers, and the low frequency and very low frequency transmitters for, um, um, submarines. Um, these are acknowledged to be dual use. Their bandwidths are going to be much lower than satellites. So they're more useful for nuclear operations than they are for conventional operations. They, so, you know, they may not be, they're not as juicy targets for Russia or China, but, you know, they're potentially juicy targets and they're not redundant. Like they're, they're, these are, you know, there are these totally have single point, you know, there, we know enough about them to know these also have single point vulnerabilities. In. And then as a last resort, there is the uh, commander controlled aircraft, um, the E4B and the E6B, which control these enormous antennae out the back um, and tr transmit in low frequency. Get, I mean, these are used for everything. I mean, you know, these would be the last result in a major war for how the president or whoever had survived would control whatever was left of the US forces. Um, these are really quite survivable today. Like, you know, this is the one command and control asset that today you look at and you go, you know, these things over the US protected by other aircraft, you could keep these things survivable. How long that will remain true for is not so clear to me. I mean, these are still like, I mean, I forget, I think some are 70s, 07s and some are 747s if I remember rightly. So these are huge commercial airframes. They are slow. They are not remotely stealthy. Because they're transmitting, like you could build a stealthy aircraft, but it ain't gonna be trans stealthy when you're transmitting at low frequency. Um, you know, I think there are legitimate questions about how long these aircraft would remain survivable for, but like right now they're survivable from that. Like, you know, that's the one big nuclear command and control asset that I can look at and go, today I'm not worried about that thing being attacked. Kinetically, you know, you've got to worry about cyber. Thanks, Tim. Uh, let me encourage people to use the, uh the icon to ask questions, but I'm gonna to turn to some of the, the items in, in the chat and see if people want to, uh, uh, to speak to the uh, the questions that they've uh, kind of put in the chat. Um, we have one from uh, Kazem uh, Akano. Um, if he is, or she, I don't know if Kazem is a, 
male or female. But in any case, if uh, that individual would like to, to ask the question, I would be pleased to call upon uh, Kazem, are you, uh, would you like to? Okay, I don't, don't uh, have a response there. Then let me go uh, down. Um, there's another question uh, in the chat uh, from um, dealing with the command and control again. Uh, Ian Kusin uh, Gika. Uh, Ian, would you like to ask the question? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Potter. Um, so my question, as Dr. Potter mentioned, has to do with command and control again. Um, it's no real secret that certain aspects of the infrastructure of the U.S. command and control system is um, outdated and can use some updating. In your sort of proposal for this increase in funding to the command and control structure, how much of that realistically do you think would be put into physical infrastructure versus other aspects of the command and control system? Thank you. It's a really interesting question. I don't have a good way of answering that here. I mean, I part of the, I mean, I said to Avner, and I stand by it, that the US is uniquely transparent about nuclear command and control. In large part, because the big pieces of hardware cost a lot and you have to justify that to Congress. And so there's a ton of money on large physical infrastructure radars, satellites, communication transmitters. There's much less on software systems, computing systems, you know, assets that are too small to be, um, you know, assets where less money is spent on them. So, you know, it, 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 it's difficult for me to know the answer to that question. I, I'd make two or three separate points here. You know, firstly, in terms of kinetic attack, the things that I worry about are satellites, the ground-based transmitters, and the radars. You know, those are those three sets of assets I think are uniquely vulnerable to kinetic attack because they're big. I mean, they're either fixed or they move in completely predictable ways. In terms of cyber attack, obviously you're a lot less worried about um, the physical size is irrelevant in cyberspace. And, you know, it, it's obviously to some extent here, the problem is how good is your coding? How good is your, you know, is your scanning of your networks to try to find intrusions? The one thing that I think you can do differently is diversity here. Um, the more diverse your systems are that rely on separate pieces of software, they can't be compromised by a single vulnerability. And unfortunately, we're going in the opposite direction. So there's a program called something like Beyond TFAB or FabT. Basically, what it is 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 it is it's the satellite receivers uh, and transmitters that you know communicate with satellites but go on the weapons themselves. And there is an effort to standardize that across nuclear forces, right? I think that is a bad idea, right? There's no question it would save money compared to developing three or four separate systems. But just as a matter of principle, it seems to me that you want to maintain as much diversity as possible if you're worried about cyber attacks, which we probably should be. Um, and so, you know, I would want to, I'm not sure I would want to try to standardize hardware in that same way because it presumably relies on the same software and that presumably creates kind of uh, similar vulnerabilities in different systems. Uh, but otherwise it's, you know, I have general principles like that, but I can't, I just don't know kind of, I, it's hard for me to go further down into the detail there of the stuff that's not like big, hard physical infrastructure. Thank you, James. James, I'm, um, it's interesting on, on my screen, immediately below your uh, uh, cell, I, I have uh, uh, Ambassador Elaine White. And so uh, I'm not gonna ask Elaine necessarily to say anything here, but it kind of oh, uh, draws my attention to how this kind of a discussion that we're having here, uh, which looks essentially at both kind of the, the cost of, of modernization, uh, as well as the uh, the programs that we might wish to emphasize, you know, how is this likely to be viewed uh, by a non-nuclear weapon state? Uh, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I tend to see you as someone who is, uh, 
uh, both interested in cost saving, but is also very much con concerned about uh, uh, you know crisis stability, uh, uh, concerns about risk reduction. Uh, and I can imagine uh, that for many uh, non-nuclear weapon states, let's say you're, you're, there's a side event uh, at the uh, forthcoming NPT review conference, and you're making the case as you did today. Um, you know, how do you uh, address the issue uh, of uh, the consistency of what you're talking about and uh, Article 6 commitments that have been undertaken uh, by the nuclear weapon states? How would you uh, respond if that kind of a question were to arise? Thanks, Bill. And, you know, I think Kazim, who I don't know if he's still online, but asked a very similar kind of question as well. Okay, I'll call, I, I, um, but let me... You know, the answer is, I mean, I, you know, being honest about this, I think most officials from non-nuclear weapon states who are not allied to the US will probably think that I'm insane. Um, you know, I, I think I'm fully aware how crazy a lot of this talk sounds to people, you know, who are not from non-nuclear weapon states or are not under, you know, part of extended deterrence commitments. I make a few points. I mean, the first thing is, I felt in going and testifying before Congress, the most effective way for me to do that would be not so much to argue with nuclear deterrent requirements, but to take those requirements and say, but we can achieve security by spending less. You know, this I, I didn't, I said nothing I didn't believe, but you know, you're always trying to tailor your approach most effectively to the audience. And you know, what I prepared, what I presented today was prepared for the House Appropriations Committee. I second thing is, you know, I I, I think that. Article six is critically important. Um, and, you know, I've started my career many years ago. It wasn't quite the first thing I wrote, but like, you know, trying to, you know, writing with George, our book, Abolishing Nuclear Weapons, thinking about, you know, how to actually go about doing this in a practical way. So, you know, it, 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 it's an issue that I spend a lot of personal time and effort thinking about. The reality as I see it now, however, is that, the politics, you know, at a time when U.S. Chinese and U.S. Russian intention, uh, uh, sorry, tensions are increasing, um, I don't see, it's very, very hard for me to see right now how we can make progress on Article 6. You know, I, I, I firmly support the U.S. and Russia negotiating another arms control treaty. Um, I think there's a lot we should do. I think achieving a lot of that is very hard right now. And as a result, my kind of personal agenda here has become focused on how do we reduce nuclear risks? Um, you know, how do we reduce the chance of a nuclear weapon going off? Um, which, you know, states parties have recognized to the NPT, have recognized as part of the Article 6 commitment. I mean, many of them would say it's, 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 it's insufficient to, for the goal of Article 6, which it is. But like, you know, before we make this problem better, we have to stop it from getting worse. Um, and I think that, you know, it's critically important to, to reduce the risk of nuclear um, um, use. And, you know, the, my, my arguments about command and control, you know, are fundamental, in particular, are fundamentally rooted in that. I mean, attacks against the command and control architecture is precisely the kind of thing that I think can inadvertently spark nuclear use in a crisis or conflict. Um, you know, personally, if it were up to me, for example, I would, um, uh, uh, cancel the low yield trident d5 program these are the low yield warheads on trident missiles is the wrong term but like i would i would replace those by the previous warheads you know that that i think is a program where the the risks outweigh any conceivable deterrent benefits um so you know a lot of my a lot of my recommendations are you know are driven by that goal of reducing nuclear risks um I don't think those were the right arguments to deploy though before appropriators. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, their job is to spend money and save money. Um, so, you know, I stress again, I said nothing I didn't believe, but you know, you're always, you know, you deploy the arguments you think are most effective to the audience you had. And in this case, it was members of the House Appropriation Committee. Thank you, James. That's, that's a, a very fair response. I see on, on the hands up, Gabumi uh, uh, Ediki. Would you like to, uh, to ask a question? We still have an individual on the, on the list here. 
Uh, perhaps we have lost that. No, I, I see uh, if uh, is Gumumi uh, Adiki uh, with us here. Okay, I, I don't, I'm not uh, eliciting a, a response here. Um, after you had another question. Yes, I do. And actually it's a follow up to what uh, Jim just said. You know, when you enter the field, that's part of my reflection too, about 15 years ago, this was the time that there was so much intellectual stimulation to think how this, you know, the four horses of the apocalypse, what, what it's mean practically to, to move to zero and how to think in semi-practical things about, about uh, evolution. A great deal happened in the last 15 years. And one of the question thing is, is this, at least for the foreseeable future, that kind of questions are gone. John Wolfstall, when he was here just about four or five years ago, he still thought about it. And his, the budget issue was very much a way that he thought, uh, a way to, to create another interest in this issue, an incentive, maybe not to go back to full abolition, but rather to think about fundamental changes in, in force structure. It seems like you give it up completely, essentially. So I wonder what's your reflection? Do you think that to some extent, the argument, the financial argument of the huge quantities of money that we're supposed to invest in modernization could be redirected into maybe not a full abol abol abolition right now, but some way to, to rethink in a fundamental way about changing our priorities and attitude towards nuclear weapons. Thanks, Aaron. I think I'm guided by what, so I mean, the, the first thing to say is it's certainly true that the focus of my efforts has moved from trying to work towards zero from reducing the risk of nuclear weapons being used. Um, and, you know, I think that does reflect real changes in the security environment and the risks that we face over the last 10 or 15 years. I think William Walker, who you know, I'm sure many people on this call know and have read, I think William got it right when he said that nuclear armed states should prepare for nuclear abolition no matter how distant it seems. And what I think that means in practice here, for example, is, you know, not, I think it is, it's, it's hard to square, you know, preparing ground-based strategic deterrent out to 2075 with Article 6. You know, I, I do think it is more consistent with Article 6 to do a Minuteman 3 life extension, which, you know, is potentially a shorter term project for 2075. Now, look, I don't think, you're going to get much credit for not from non-nuclear weapon states for you know doing a life extension on minimum three rather than um, um, you know building a whole new ICBM and you know I frankly wouldn't expect much credit but it's consistent with that basic principle that we should be preparing for nuclear abolition no matter how distant it seems and you know if I were in government one of the, the kinds of things that I would push in government let me just give you one example. Um, In order to get to a world without nuclear weapons, we would have to be able to account for fissile material production. Um, and dismantling fissile material production facilities shouldn't, before we dismantle them, we should do things like take samples and leave them under IEA seal. We can do that in the United States or the United Kingdom or wherever it is to enable verification to happen in the future. And that's something that if you don't do it now, it will never happen. Uh, that I think is another good example for preparing for to abolition no matter how distant it is. I should say, Abner, I actually don't think the budget process is the right process to kind of rethink nuclear deterrence fundamentally. It's always gonna be a series of super tactical fights, right? Let's have a fight over, um, uh, the B-21. Okay, that fight's been lost. Now let's move on to uh, LRSO. 
Uh, now let's move on to the B, B, you know, B61. Now let's move on to GBSD. Now let's move on to the nuclear arm slicker. You're right. It, 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 it's the nature of these things is they're sequential. And, you know, committees, the appropriations committees is not going to try and rethink the whole of deterrence. It will make decisions on programs one at a time. So, you know, I think it's, it's a critically important policy lever. You know, I think it's, a, as I said at the very beginning of my remarks, like I think it's an area that it's really worth engaging with. But, I, you know, it's always going to be a pretty tactical thing. It's not a great forum, I think, for rethinking nuclear deterrence in any fundamental sense. Thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, we have maybe time for uh, two more questions. I see, Sarah, you have your, your hand up uh, again, if I'm not mistaken. If you'd like to uh, kind of ask a question, I'm pleased to call on, upon you. Thanks, Bill. Um, this is not so much a question, but just a reflection on, on what James and Avner were just talking about. I mean, I do wonder in my own work, sort of how much the incredible cost of dealing with the COVID-19 you know, pandemic and sort of what that will mean for global budgets and global economies might reshape or, or change the dynamic that you just described, James, where, you know, budget considerations are sort of a lever for doing what elites might decide that they want to do and make sense from the standpoint of national security and their own kind of um, positions to something that is a little bit more of a broader conversation about whether we can genuinely afford to, you know, sort of engage in whatever great power competition you know on all levels or what have you so um i was just thinking about that as you were speaking and i wonder what you think about that it's it's the kind of thing that i think is more likely to happen 10 years from now than now like the thing is that right now costs of nukes you know we're only at the beginning of the bow wave right now and, and, and the costs are going to rise dramatically and I think, you know, one of the arguments I tried to make was that if you think you may have to cancel something in 10 or 15 years when the costs are so much higher, like it's much better to decide that now uh, and not waste all that money in the interim, which is kind of in the abstract, it's quite an appealing argument. In practice, um, Congress likes kicking, you know, it's just easier to kick the can down the road than it is to try to make hard decisions now. So, you know, my, my guess is that 10 or 15 years from now when spending really ramps up, there are gonna be hard decisions that are gonna be made and programs are gonna be cut. Um, but, you know, how much of an effect COVID will have on budgets 10 or 15 years from now and what the overall fiscal situation would look like. I mean, it, it's a world of such uncertainty as the fact. So, you know, unfortunately, I think like that kind of conversation, we're probably, as I say, just like 10 or 15 years too early for right now. I mean, just the timescales associated with these modernization programs are so huge. It's kind of very hard to get people to think about, you know, what the budget will look like in 10 or 15 years from now, you know, especially in the house where people are on two year terms, like, you know, it, it's just not, the timescales are so incommensurate with one another. Thanks, James. We have a, 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 a question from Adrian English. Adrian, do you want to ask your question? Yes, I'm here. If you can see me and hear me. Um, I was just curious to hear your view about how hypersonic technology might change the equation. Um, you commented about launch on an attack as a response in a nuclear exchange. Do you they, they, they see that like changing into the future as the technology evolves in, in terms of speed? And how does that impact the command and control structure when things are happening so quickly? Adrian, I, I think we're, uh, I'm not sure that the, the sound came uh, through adequately. At least I had a hard time. Uh, I, did, but I, got, I think I got the question just, though, Bill, just, because Adrian put some of it in the uh, comment section. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I'm actually dialing in. So it's a fascinating question. I think hypersonics does undermine launch under attack, but not for the obvious reason. I mean, the obvious reason is hypersonic weapons are faster. You know, you would think hypersonic weapons are faster than 
non-hypersonic weapons, and so you have less time. But you know, ballistic missiles are hypersonic. Um, and I think you mentioned so 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 you know, I don't think an attack against silos necessarily happens faster with hypersonic weapons than it does with ballistic missiles. The two differences, and I think you mentioned command and control, but one is attacks against command and control. I mean, conventional hypersonic weapons, one of the reasons they worry me most is because of the possibility of attacks on command and control. Again, you know, these kind of incidental attacks in which there's non-nuclear attacks against dual use command and control assets uh, that has the effect of degrading nuclear capabilities. Um, that's not just a problem of hypersonics, it's a problem of cyber capabilities, of anti-satellite capabilities. Um, but these kinds of capabilities, um, um, you know, if the command and control system is undermined, then you then that undermines the whole co concept of um, um, launch under attack. The second problem is whether, you know, hypersonic weapons, boost glide systems in particular, fly at a quite different trajectory from ballistic missiles. So boost glide systems are, are gonna underfly existing early warning radars. That's also, a, you know, it's obviously a problem for launch under attack if you have less ability to see incoming weapons. Um, now, I think early warning satellites probably can see boost glide weapons the whole way through their trajectory, but right, the US requirement is for dual phenomenology. Uh, it's for two physically independent means of detecting an incoming nuclear attack. Uh, and so I think dual phenomenology is potentially harder. This is, I haven't actually thought about this before, but I think it, it, it's a really good argument that dual phenomenology is going to be hard to maintain in the face of Russian, uh, you know, hypersonic capabilities, including avant-garde. Um, but that's actually, that's actually, yeah, no, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that before, but that's, I think, actually an important point. So I think, I think hypersonics does have real implications for launch under attack, uh, but not because of the speed of hypersonic weapons per se. Thank you very much, James. Um, I'm going to, we have uh, maybe uh, five or six minutes left before uh, we're going to have to conclude here, because I know James has uh, kind of other commitments. Uh, but let me ask if there's anyone uh, who has yet to, uh, to ask a question, uh, and it may be that I, I, uh, you have difficulty uh, kind of signaling your desire to ask, uh, please feel uh, you know, free to, to speak up at this moment, and uh, I'm pleased to give uh, you the floor. Let me first turn to anyone who has yet to ask any questions. Uh, now is your, your opportunity to, uh, to speak up. I don't see anyone. Um, so James, let me ask, unless I'm missing somebody here, um, let me ask um, you uh, to kind of pursue the, the reference that you made to um, uh, Elizabeth Warren and, and Ted Cruz, which is indeed a, an interesting uh, kind of couple uh, here. Um, what is it that you believe is kind of driving their uh, interest uh, in command and control, and can we build upon uh, the incentives uh, uh, of this unusual uh, kind of couple who tend to agree on very, very little else to perhaps uh, gain some traction uh, on the question of a, a greater investment in the uh, uh, command and control of CQ die realm? Can you, can you share anything with us in terms of the factors that lead them to be uh, supportive of this? Um, I don't know. I mean, my, my honest answer is I, I don't know. Uh, in the case of, I mean, this was a number of few years ago, kind of I was speaking to a member of Elizabeth Warren's staff. And, you know, one of the questions you often ask when you ask congressional staff is, you know, who else would you recommend we speak to? And slightly to my amazement, she said, you know, Ted Cruz is really interested in these issues. Um, at a practical level, Ted Cruz has moved from armed services to foreign relations, um, which means his ability to influence this area has basically evaporated. I and mean, if you're not on a committee, it's very, very hard to influence the work of that committee. And this is this was all authorization committees, the not 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 appropriation committee. So, you know, as much as for all I know, Ted Cruz still has this interest, like he's just not in a position to act upon it any longer. Um, I, 
it's a great, I, I wish I had asked their staff that question, you know, why is the member so interested in this subject? I didn't, and I kind of regret doing that now, or rather not doing that now. Um, you know, I think it would have been, it would have been a very useful thing to know. Um, but it is, uh, you know, it is this weird niche area, and I just can't tell you why those two members were particularly interested. And it was useful for me at the time they were, but like, you know, um, I just don't know why. Okay, James. That I'm wasn't gonna a very honor, informative answer. I'm going to honor your request that we uh, conclude, uh, you know, by, by 145. Uh, I do want to express my great appreciation for uh, your taking the time to, uh, to speak with us. Uh, I think it was really a, a very uh, informative presentation and very interesting uh, exchange of views with uh, staff and, and students. Uh, and I, I certainly uh, wish to extend uh, an invitation for you to uh, return to Monterey uh, when uh, conditions allow. We'd love to, uh, to have you here. Uh, you speak on so many different topics in an eloquent fashion. Uh, uh, we uh, will try to schedule something as, as soon as you give us the, uh, the thumbs up. So. Uh, Please join me in extending uh, or uh, congratulating James on a fascinating presentation. Thanks so much, James.